prayer was a part of the daily rhythm of Jesus' life. It was while he was praying at his baptism that the heavens suddenly broke open and the Holy Spirit descended on him. We find him on top of a mountain praying throughout the night before choosing his disciples. Mark's gospel talks about the time he pulled an all-nighter, healing the town folk of their diseases and casting out demons. But afterward, instead of grabbing some shut-eye, Mark reports that in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Jesus prayed any time there was an important decision to be made. And this morning's reading immediately follows Jesus revealing to his disciples a future of rejection, suffering, and an untimely and violent death there was any time that he needed support it was now and so he took his three closest friends up the mountain to join him in prayer and it was while he was praying that a change seemed to come over him writer Debbie Thomas describes the scene this way on the mountain a man bent in prayer erupts in sudden light as glory leaks from every pore, three sleepy disciples cower in the grass and watch their master glow. God's light was being revealed in a very literal way on top of this mountain. But it wasn't the first time it had been revealed in Jesus' life. For more than a month now, we've been exploring how God's light was revealed in the life of Jesus. Shortly after his birth, with the visit of the Magi, God's light was revealed as a hope for the nations. At the beginning of his ministry, when Jesus stepped into the Jordan River, God's light was revealed as a baptism of belovedness. And throughout his life, as we have seen, God's light was revealed through Jesus' generosity, his call to justice, and his prophetic voice. No, it wasn't the first time that God's light had been revealed in the life of Jesus, but it was most certainly the most dramatic revelation of God to date. And even as glory leaked from every pore of his body, two ancestral figures appeared, presumably Moses and Elijah. And our reading sounds as if they might have been giving him encouragement as Jesus came to grips with the imminence of his death. And Peter, being the good extrovert that he was, began to babble. Recognizing the importance of the moment but understanding nothing about it, Peter wanted to freeze time, memorialize it, do something, anything but just sit there. And that's when a cloud envelops everyone. It's not hard to anticipate what's, going, what's coming next because the Bible always seems to associate clouds with God's presence. When the ancient Israelites wandered in the wilderness after escaping Egypt, God directed their way as a pillar of fire by night and as a pillar of cloud during the day. When they felt hungry or thirsty or scared, all they needed to do was look to the cloud to remind them of God's presence. Later on, God would speak to Moses out of a cloud that had settled on a mountain. And it was within the thickness of that cloud that God would give Moses the Ten Commandments. After leaving that mountain, the Israelites continued to receive instruction from God through a cloud that filled a portable tabernacle into which only Moses was allowed to enter. So when we read that a cloud came and overshadowed Jesus and the disciples, even in the middle of Peter's gibberish, we have a sense of what's coming next. Debbie Thomas imagines the voice of God to be a tender and gentle voice, one that hums with delight, the voice of a parent's pure joy that sings with the stars. 
Lori Hell, on the other hand, likens it to a cosmic hand from heaven reaching down to Peter to give Peter a good you're missing the point slap upside the head. I'm inclined to side with the latter. I see God interrupting Peter's drivel with a direct order to quit running his mouth and for once, for once, just listen. Just sit in the cloud and listen. But that's not what we want to do, is it? We get nervous and uncomfortable when there's too much silence, whether that's in a conversation or a worship setting. We're unaccustomed to just sitting in silence in the cloud, experiencing God's holy presence and opening ourselves to the still small voice that speaks to our hearts. Most often, our prayers are filled with a long list of please and thank yous and we quickly sign off with our amen without ever thinking to just sit in silence for a moment or two in anticipation of a response from God. Had Peter not been nudged into silence, he might have missed out entirely on the weight and significance of this epic moment, an event that would forever change his life. And although we typically think of the episode as that of Jesus being transfigured before the eyes of Peter and James and John, it certainly had to be a transformative moment in the lives of the disciples too. They would never be able to look at Jesus the same way again. For that matter, they would probably never be able to look at life the same way again either. In one brief nuclear blast of time and space, their lives were instantly transformed. But epiphanies aren't always mountaintop, multidimensional explosions. Sometimes those transformational moments are made up of the simple stuff of life. Frederick Beekner writes what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say when describes what I'm trying to say when he writes the face of a man walking with his child in the park of a woman baking bread of sometimes even the unlikeliest person listening to a concert say or standing barefoot in the sand watching the waves roll in or just having a beer at a Saturday baseball game in July. Every once and so often, Beatner writes, something so touching, so incandescent, so alive, transfigures the human face that it's almost beyond bearing. A story was told by a surgeon about a young couple after the doctor had to perform a disfiguring surgery on the wife's face so that she could live. As a result of the surgery, the young woman would never be able to smile on one side of her face again. The surgeon felt very bad about this and watched with a heavy heart as the husband went into his wife's room and saw her for the first time a line drawing her, her mouth down on one side. I think it's kind of cute, he said, your crooked little smile. The doctor said that he had to look away from these two young people as if the light were too bright for him to bear. Those transformational moments are taking place every day both in our joy and in our grief. As Thomas Merton once said, we are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time. All we need to do is to stop long enough, open our eyes, close our mouths, and hold tight because God is in the transformational business transfiguring both individual lives as well as the lives of congregations. So here's my question for you. 
In what area of your life are you waiting for God's transformational presence? Where do you feel as if you are lacking? Do you find it hard to trust others? Do you find it hard to love yourself? Is there something in your past that weighs you down with guilt or shame? Well, we have been promised that for anyone who is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old order has passed away. Now everything is new. The transfiguration of Jesus offers up a glimpse of what is possible, not only for Jesus, but for all of humanity. It's happening all the time, everywhere you look. So if we can manage to take the earbuds out of our ears and look up from our smartphones, we've got a chance of experiencing a transfiguration that could change not only our own life, but the lives of others too. God is revealing God's self every day in ways that will transform our lives. May we be open to the Spirit working in and through us so that we might also be transfigured. And in so doing, may we shine the light of God throughout the world. Amen.